Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and welcome to the sixth video in our free Greenland paddle building series, where we're gonna be talking about laminating a Greenland paddle out of smaller strips of wood and adding hardwood edges. Now, this is a longer video because we've got a lot to cover, but it's worth watching the whole thing because making a good glue up is sometimes a bit trickier than it seems like it should be. Now, remember, this is a series, so if you haven't done this already, make sure that you go back and at least watch the introduction video. I'll throw a link up on the screen for that right now, and you can find the entire playlist with all these videos in order here on the channel. You can also find this entire series for free without any commercials on my website. And then, as always, if you want to support the free content that we put out here, think about picking up a set of our paddle plans, checking out our skin on frame boat building courses, buying your next piece of paddling gear from us, or just making a donation. You can find all that stuff on our website and there are links in the video description below. And of course, if you have any thoughts or any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments. All right, enjoy the video. Now, in addition to building your Greenland paddle out of a solid piece of wood, you can also laminate it out of smaller strips. And this has advantages and disadvantages. So starting with the disadvantages, obviously you're gonna need to be able to make these smaller strips, which means you're probably gonna have to have a table saw, which is a little bit harder than just going to the lumber yard and picking out a two by four. Now, additionally, the laminating process actually adds significant time to the paddle building process overall, especially when you consider that once you're proficient in this system, it should take you less than four hours to build a Greenland paddle from start to finish. Now, also you have to factor in the cost of the glue, which may not be that significant if you're just gonna try to get away with something like Type Bond 3 or Gorilla Glue, but if you're heading into a really good marine grade epoxy like G-Flex, that's gonna add another 30 to $40 to the cost of your project, unless you already have it sitting around. Also, if you're gonna be laminating, you're gonna need a minimum of 10 bar clamps or large C clamps, and at least 12 two inch spring clamps, and it's better if you have more of each of those. So those are the disadvantages. Now getting into the advantages, because this is made with smaller strips of wood, if you live someplace where you can't find a full size paddle blank out of a suitable species of wood, but you can find that species of wood in smaller strips that are at least as wide as the paddle is thick, you can always glue up your paddle blank that way. Also, if you find a piece of wood that would otherwise make a good paddle blank, but it's just a little bit too curved, you can slice that up on your table saw and then flip those pieces opposite to each other, glue them back together, and that will straighten out that board. Now, another advantage to laminating is if you have smaller hands, this will allow you to build your loom small enough to accommodate your hand size without risking a paddle that is gonna be too weak. So if you're in that situation, your choices are to either build your entire paddle out of a stronger species of wood like spruce, or you can just glue the loom of your paddle out of a stronger species of wood like spruce. And then if you wanna save some weight, you can put red cedar on the outside of it or you can do what we're gonna do here today, which is laminate a very thin strip of a stronger species of wood right down the middle of the paddle between two pieces of cedar on the loom, and that will give you a stronger loom that can be carved thinner without adding extra weight. Now, speaking of loom size, another advantage to laminating is that it lets you skip one of the more challenging parts of this whole process, which is cutting the loom perfectly straight and then smoothing it down perfectly to your hand size. And for some people with good technique and sharps tools, this really isn't a big deal, but for other people, it can be a bit more of a challenge. But the nice thing about laminating is because the loom is glued up separate from the blades, you don't have to worry about making that inside cut and the loom is automatically straight and easier to round over. Now, the final nice thing about laminating is that if you want to, it allows you to add a slightly harder wood to the outside of the paddle to give it a little bit of extra durability. Because for all the nice things about red cedar being really light and enjoyable to paddle with, it is not the strongest wood. And if you're hard on your paddles, a red cedar paddle is gonna get beat up over time. So taking a look at today's paddle, before we get started, I just wanna make it clear that there's lots of different strategies for laminating, just depending on what wood you have available and what you're trying to accomplish. So this is just what I'm doing today. So this paddle is gonna be a seven piece glue up. The piece in the middle is 3 16 of an inch thick. The next two pieces are a half of an inch thick. And then the pieces on the outside are 9 16 and the nice thing about working with wood of this dimension is that it is much easier to find strips of wood like this than it is to purchase a solid, perfectly clear vertical grain two by four. 
And oftentimes you can even get this out of wood that is lower grade because you can cut around the knots. Now, when you're planning your paddle and deciding how long to make it, I would recommend adding another quarter to half inch at either end because when you're done with the glue up and you've got all the glue on the end here, it's nice to be able to come back with a chop saw and just cut that end nice and clean so you've got a nice clear end to work with. Now, moving on to the wood that we're using, starting on the outside here, we've got a couple pieces of Port Orford cedar, which isn't a super dense wood, but it is denser than red cedar. And so that's gonna give me a little bit more protection towards the edges of the tips and about halfway down the edges of the paddle. And because those edges get carved so thin, it's really not gonna add much extra weight. The nice thing about working with a medium density species as opposed to a true hardwood for your edge protection is that if you're a beginning builder and your tools aren't that sharp, this is gonna be a lot easier to carve. Now, coming in from there, I've got a couple pieces of red cedar, which is really light and really easy to carve, which is why I like using it for paddles. These are just going down the blades. And then I've got a couple more pieces of red cedar right here that extend all the way through the center of the loom to the other end of the paddle. And then finally, right in the middle here, I have a narrow strip of Port Orford cedar. This is just 3 16ths of an inch wide, and quite honestly, I don't even need it for strength on this paddle. So in this case, this is just for demonstration purposes, but if you're someone who's gonna be really hard on your paddle, or you're someone with smaller hands that needs a smaller loom, running a narrow strip of a harder wood right up the center of the paddle is gonna give you that extra strength, but still keep the rest of the paddle as light as possible. Now, another nice thing about a strip up the center like this is that it gives you an automatic center line down the middle of the blade throughout the entire paddle building process, which is just nice as a reference point. Now, if you don't wanna do a three-piece laminated loom like this, the other option is just to make the entire loom out of a denser species of wood, so you can make the loom a little bit smaller or it's gonna be a little bit stronger. But if you're doing that, I probably wouldn't go with something as dense as Port Orford Cedar because at 30 pounds per cubic foot, not only is this gonna add more weight to the paddle than I want, but also it's gonna negatively affect the flex of the paddle. So usually if I'm doing a solid wooden loom down the middle here, I try not to make it out of anything heavier than say 27 pounds, maybe 28 pounds per cubic foot, which is usually gonna be some sort of spruce species. Now, another thing that's important to pay attention to here is anytime you're laminating up a paddle like this, you really wanna to try to make these pieces out of wood that is either a vertical grain or nearly vertical grain. And the reason that matters is because when you get into a laminated paddle like this, if you've got flat grain pieces where the grain is along the edge right here, those have to be perfectly aligned with each other. Because if you've got one piece where the grain is diving down a little bit and another piece where the grain is coming up a little bit, what that means is that when you go to carve it with your block plane, regardless of what direction you carve from, if you're crossing these grain lines with the blade, you're gonna be chipping out wood on one side or the other, and it's gonna make it impossible to carve. And so the easiest way to circumvent that problem is just to build your paddle with vertical grain pieces like this. That way you're not gonna be digging into those grain lines. So taking a look at this laminating station, the most important thing about any glue up is that you're as organized as possible before you get started. Because especially if you're working with a fast curing glue, if you have to stop and search for clamps or fumble, it's really easy to burn through all your cure time and then you end up with a bad lamination. So I've got plastic down on my workbench to protect it from the glue. And I've set the paddle up on some two by twos here just to get it a little bit up off the table so I can work around it with my clamps. And I always cut these two by twos as long as they need to be for me to be able to flatten out all these pieces to spread the glue on them without having to drop these down onto a different surface. And then I've also got all my clamps just ready off to the side here. I've got, in this case, four bar clamps for this end, I've got four bar clamps for this end, and I've got a bunch of spring clamps which I'm gonna use on the loom, but I'm also gonna use those to capture the blade up and down so these laminations don't become misaligned. So I normally make myself about 20 of these pieces out of scrap wood. Once again, these are 3 16 thick by about four inches long, and I usually put about three of those on each blade. And if I'm laminating the loom, I'll put a few on the loom as well before I start clamping the blank tight. I've cut myself a couple of thin spreader sticks that are exactly as wide as the paddle is thick. And then finally, I've got a combination square to square up the ends of the paddle while I'm working. 
I've got some disposable gloves to protect my hands, and I've got this eight ounce tube of Gorilla Glue, which is definitely more glue than I'm gonna need, but anytime you're laminating, it's way better to have too much glue than to run out halfway through. Now, as far as different glue choices, I have always used Gorilla Glue. I like it because it's waterproof, it's flexible, it's relatively strong, and it's easy to work with, and it cures quickly. Now, other people have told me that they have glued up their paddles with Tight Bond 3 and they haven't had a problem with it. I can't really speak to that because I don't have a lot of experience using that glue. So if you do decide to glue up your paddle with Tight Bond 3, please drop me a line after a couple years and let me know how that's working out for you. Now, other people that are a little bit nervous about the gluing strength of Gorilla Glue will go for something even more hardcore, like a gap-filling epoxy like G-Flex. And that will certainly work for the job, but you have to keep in mind that G-Flex is extremely expensive and it's also very toxic. So if you're gonna work with it, you need to have good ventilation and a respirator. Now, on the other hand, there are situations in which I think G-Flex makes sense, specifically if you're working with pieces that aren't very smooth, so they don't have good gluing surfaces, or if you're gonna be using an alternate clamping method where you don't have good clamping pressure. Let's say you're gonna be wrapping this in bicycle inner tubes as opposed to using bar clamps. In that case, I think it's probably a lot safer to use a gap filling epoxy. So starting the process, I'm gonna square up all the pieces on the end here. And then I'm gonna put the square on top of the paddle blank and I'm gonna mark this with a pencil. And this mark is helpful for a couple reasons. One, it makes sure that as you're clamping this together, as long as this is lined up, you know that the end is square. But also, if you've oriented these pieces in a specific way for purposes of flex, or maybe because you needed the grain to be a certain way, this makes sure that as long as you can see this line while you're clamping, all of these pieces are still oriented the right way. All right, so moving on to the actual glue up. In the next step, we're gonna spread some glue and then we're gonna clamp these pieces together. But before we do that, if you're working with Gorilla Glue, there's an additional step. And that is we need to lightly moisten one of the surfaces that's gonna get glued to cure the glue. Now, the operative word here is lightly. You definitely don't wanna put a bunch of water on this so it looks nice and wet because that's gonna cause the Gorilla Glue to cure way too fast and you're not gonna get good glue joints. So the way I do this is I get myself a paper towel and I just put a few drops of water on this so it feels lightly moist. And then watch very carefully how I do this because you gotta make sure that you keep all these pieces oriented so you don't get confused and put glue or water in the wrong place. So what we're gonna do is take these outside pieces and turn them inward like this and spread them out. Now, you can put water on these or not, it doesn't really matter because there's not gonna be another layer on the outside of these. These are the pieces that we're looking to moisten. So once again, we're gonna take these pieces and turn them inwards like this. And then you're gonna take these pieces and turn them inwards like that. And then you've got this piece down the middle. So next thing you're gonna do is grab your lightly moistened paper towel and you're gonna moisten both sides of this center stripe if you have a center stripe. If you have a solid center loom, you're gonna moisten both sides of the center loom. Once again, you're not looking to make this really wet. You're just looking to put a little bit of moisture on it. So both sides of the center strip here. And then you're gonna moisten everything you can see at this point. And as far as the right amount of moisture here, if you can see just a little bit of a color change, that's fine. You don't wanna see this looking dark and wet like you just sprayed water on it. We're just looking to put a tiny amount of moisture on these surfaces. And then before I move on to my glue up, I usually like to wait for about five or 10 minutes for these to dry out a little bit more just to make sure I don't have too much water on here. So if you're working with Gorilla Glue and you've just moistened these surfaces, next thing we're gonna do is flip these pieces over so we can put glue on the other side. Now, obviously, all you have to do here is just flip these over individually, but for the benefit of everyone who's not working with Gorilla Glue, I'm just gonna reverse this process and stand these pieces back up. So I'm looking at that black line that we drew all the way across the top. And this is your starting point if you're not working with Gorilla Glue. So, Next thing we're gonna do is turn these pieces like this outward 
So the black lines are all facing to the outside, and then we're gonna apply glue to these surfaces, but not the centerpiece. Now, before we start gluing, I just wanna remind you that every glue is gonna have a different cure time. So if you're working with Tight Bond 3 or G-Flex, both of those have a pretty long open time, so you shouldn't have any problems getting this done. But if you're working with a faster curing epoxy or you're working with Gorilla Glue, you're gonna to have to work fast and you're gonna to have to be really efficient so you don't waste time because you want to have all of this clamped together within 10 minutes of when you first start spreading this glue, which is kind of hard to get done. Now, at the very outside, you wanna have this clamped together within 15 minutes, but you really wanna shoot for 10. So when you're working with Gorilla Glue, you really wanna to try to put on exactly the right amount when you're laying down your bead, because if you put too much of this on and you have to scrape it off, it's gonna take time and it's gonna make a big mess. And if you don't put enough on, you're gonna to have to come back and put a second layer, which is also gonna take more time. And so just go ahead and take a guess for your first layer right here. And then you're gonna grab your spreader and you're gonna smooth this down. And if you have the right amount of glue on there, this should feel like it's just scraping the wood a little bit. If it feels like you're just completely gliding over the wood, that means you've got too much glue on. But on the other hand, if it feels like you have to press really hard and you're scraping the wood really hard, that means you don't have enough. So I would do one line, see how it feels, and then you can adjust the size of your bead on your next one. You can either put a little more or a little less, just depending on how that worked out for you. Once again, I like to feel this spreader scraping against the wood a little bit, but if I'm scraping really hard against the wood, that means I probably don't have enough on. You definitely don't wanna to have too much of this stuff on because it will expand and it will actually force the glue joint open. So once you feel like you've got a good sensitivity for how much glue to put on, you can just go ahead and spread the other pieces. I'm gonna go all the way down the loom on this one. If you don't have a center stripe, you won't be putting anything on the loom because the sides will just be glued to that. And then come back with my spreader. And once you start doing this, you've just got to stay focused and don't stop because you've got to get these clamped together within 10 minutes of when you first start pouring the glue. And then next, we're just going to fold all these pieces back together the way that they came apart. So I'm going to fold these pieces onto the center strip right here. And I'm going to fold these pieces in and these pieces in take a moment to square up the end with this combination square. If you get any glue on your combination square, make sure you write, wipe it off right away, otherwise it's gonna be hard to get off later. So next up, we're gonna align these pieces, top and bottom, by sandwiching it between these little hardwood plates I showed you earlier. I'm gonna come a little bit back from the end right here, and I'm gonna squeeze this on. I'm gonna put one of these two inch spring clamps on one side, and I'm gonna put another one on another side, and then I'm gonna come back halfway along the blade and I'm gonna do the same thing. And then I'm gonna come back toward the other end of the blade and do the same thing. And then obviously I'm gonna do the same thing down at the other end as well. And then once again, working quickly, we're gonna come in here and just start the clamping process. Now on this very end clamp here, if you're worried about denting the wood, either use a clamp that has some pads on it or use a couple blocks of wood on the outside. For the rest of the clamps, it doesn't matter because it's all gonna get cut off. So just gonna tighten this down. Make sure you put the clamps halfway between the top and the bottom. You don't wanna to go too crazy when you're tightening clamps, but you should see a little bit of glue squeeze out. And then I'm gonna to come to the middle here and I'm gonna put a clamp in the middle. Now I'm only using five clamps right now, but quite honestly, six or seven clamps is probably a little bit better for this. It really depends on the size of your laminations. The thinner your laminations, the more clamps you're gonna need. 
And then I'm going to come to the end of it right here and I'm going to set another clamp. Once again, make sure the clamps are halfway between the top and the bottom so it squeezes out evenly. And then I'm going to set clamps going the other way in the opposite direction. And you can see that you've got to work pretty darn quickly to get all these clamps on before you run into that 10 minute cure time. Now, if you've got a laminated loom, it's helpful to have a couple smaller pieces like this. And then you can usually just get away with setting one clamp just like that. And then finally, I'm gonna come in here on the loom and I'm just gonna do this with a ton of spring clamps because I have a ton of spring clamps. If you've got another type of clamp, feel free to do that as well. So I'm just gonna put a whole bunch of these on here. If you're gonna use spring clamps for this, you really need to stack them up tight like this. And I like to make sure that I have at least one real clamp right in the middle of the loom. Now, if you're building a loom that's laminated out of thin strips like I am, there's one more thing you've got to do here, and that is to check that the paddle is straight before you walk away. Because anytime you've got thin strips, there's always the possibility that you can accidentally glue your paddle into a curve. Now, the only way that I've figured out to do this is to get myself some type of a string and then run it through all my clamps from end to end. And then you're going to clamp the string exactly in the center at one end of the paddle and then you're going to come to the opposite end and you're going to pull it really tight and wrap it around like this. And then you're going to clamp it exactly in the center at the opposite edge of the paddle. And then you want to come to the center of the loom, look straight down on the string, and if it's not exactly in the center, you're going to have to make some adjustments. So in this case, it looks like my string is about an eighth of an inch off center on the loom. So I'm going to set a couple clamps, one at either end, so the ends of the paddle can't move. And then I'm going to come to the center here, and I'm just going to move this a little bit until that string is right in the center. But before I step away from this, I'm going to come to the ends of the paddle, and I'm going to double check that this string is exactly in the center of the ends. And it's also helpful just to loosen it and pull it tight one more time and clamp it down just to make sure that your clamps weren't deflecting the string off to one side or the other and then double check it again in the middle. Now, once you're done with your clamping, you actually want to stick around and monitor the consistency of this glue because we want to catch this right before it hardens so we can take off all these alignment blocks that we put on with the spring clamps. Because if you don't do that, you're going to come back later and all these are going to be glued to the surface of the paddle, which is going to make it really hard to clean up. So sometime between 15 to 30 minutes after you finish clamping, if you're working with Gorilla Glue, you're going to want to come back and just take these clamps off and then take these blocks off all the way down the paddle. You also want to take a moment to separate this from the wooden blocks that it's sitting on top of so it doesn't get stuck to those either. And if you waited a little bit too long and these are glued on here, usually you can just come in with a hammer and hit it. And most of the time it's not going to cause any damage to the paddle. Now, as far as how long to leave this clamped for, it just depends on the glue that you're using. So if you're using Type Bond 3 or if you're using epoxy, just follow the manufacturer's recommendations. If you're using Gorilla Glue, in about two hours, this should be hard enough for you to be able to take off these clamps. And you want to try to catch this at a point where the glue is not sticky, but it's still just a little bit soft because that's going to make it way easier to clean this glue off with a chisel. So. I'm going to come in here and take off all these clamps. Next, you want to clamp the paddle down to your workbench. You're going to grab a chisel and then you're going to come down to the opposite end and cut this glue off. And as long as you can catch this at the stage when the glue is just a little bit soft, it's a lot easier to cut this off with a chisel. And just like any time you're using a chisel, you always want to have both hands behind the tool. Anytime you're doing something like this, you're doing something dangerous. So both hands behind the chisel, you can cut all this glue off. And this doesn't have to be perfect because this entire surface is going to get cut off in a later stage in the process. All right, so taking a look at the finished paddle blank, remember if you made your paddle a little bit longer so you could clean up the end by coming back with a cross cut, you can go ahead and make that cut now.
And then finally, I just want to finish up by talking about marking out the blade shape, because even though the instructions are very similar to the normal instructions, which you're going to see in the upcoming videos, there's a couple of important differences that you need to be aware of. Now, the basic idea here is you're going to measure a little bit off the loom and make a mark, and then you're going to lay the straight edge on top of it here, and you're going to mark out the blade shape, and then you're going to come back and cut it out. But the big difference with a laminated loom is that when we go to mark out the shoulders, we're going to use a slightly different measurement. Normally, when we mark out the loom onto a solid paddle blank, we grab a quarter inch wide spacer and put it against that line and mark to the outside of it. But in the case of a laminated loom, you're going to want to get yourself a 5 16 of an inch thick spacer, and then you're going to press this against the loom and slide it forward like this. And then you're going to make sure that you're marking to the outside of that. So there is a full 5 16 of an inch from the inside edge of this Sharpie line to the outside edge of the loom right here. And the reason it's different is because the amount that you would normally cut off of those black lines for marking out the loom has already been taken off here and the loom is at the finished dimension. So we have to make this a little bit wider to compensate. So I'm just going to do the same thing on the other side. And it's really important that you do this with a Sharpie and not a pencil because the width of this black line is actually an important part of our measuring system. And then once you've got these marked out, you're just going to grab your straight edge, set it on top of the paddle. You're going to line one end up with the Sharpie mark. And when you line this up, you never want to put this in the middle of the Sharpie mark. You want to leave the whole Sharpie mark exposed. So when you draw forward from here, you're drawing on the same line. And then as per the normal instructions, I just slide the other end of this straight edge so it's flush with the outside corner of the tip. And then you want to press relatively hard when you're making this Sharpie line because the thickness of the Sharpie line is actually part of the marking system. Now, one last thing I forgot to mention when I was first filming this video is that once you get to this step where you clean up the glue with a chisel, the next thing you want to do is plane down your blank because that's going to clean up these surfaces even better and it's going to make it easier to draw your marks and see your marks in the next step where we're going to cut out the blade shape. Now, additionally, planing this down is going to bring it to the desired thickness, which for the type of paddle you just saw me make is going to be 1 and 7 16 So I'm only going to be taking a little bit off either side. But if you're making your paddle out of a significantly heavier species of wood because you didn't have any other choice, in that case, you might want to go a little bit narrower. So it seems like I'm always changing my mind on these things. So I would recommend checking out the paddle plans where you're going to find my most recent recommendations for thickness and overall paddle sizing. Now, as far as how to actually do this, if you have a stationary planer, that's great. Just set it really fine, run your paddle through, flip it over, run it through again, and then make sure you're measuring it as you go so you don't go too far. But if you're going to do this with a handheld power planer, keep in mind that if there are any little bumps left on the surface, the plane is going to ride up onto those and then it's not going to plane flat. So if you're using a handheld power planer, just make sure you really carefully go over the whole thing to make sure you don't have any surprises. Also keep in mind, that the blade on a handheld power planer is a little bit narrower than your paddle blank, which means you're going to have a little strip on one side that isn't planed down. In that case, you want to come back and hit that with your block plane. Don't try to come back and hit it with a power plane because you're going to end up screwing things up. 